Hello friends and welcome to my channel. My name is Katya and this time I want you to meet a very extraordinary Finnish woman from the 19th century. And while I'm telling her story, we'll be making an outfit she wore in the 1860s. A Finnish-speaking working-class girl who became a celebrated author, activist and reformer in a society that was turned against her. Minna was born in 1844 in Tampere, Finland as Ulrika Filhelmina Johnston, but everyone remembers her as Minna Kant. Tampere was a growing industrial town and the Finlation cotton mills dominated the landscape. Her father, Gustav, was named Johnston like all the children of the Finlayson factory orphanage. Her mother, Ulrika, came from a poor background and was a religious woman, strict but also generous. Gustav had risen in the ranks of the Finlayson cotton mills to a headman and noticed the sharp wits of Minna early. Minna got to go to the factory children's school where all the learning was done in Swedish. Many children in the school also had to work in the factory after school to support themselves and their poor families. In 1851 Johnson family moved to Kuopio where Gustav was tasked to take care of the Finlayson shop that sold fabric and yarn. Eight-year-old Minna was sent to school where she could study in Finnish for the first time. She then was able to continue studies in Swedish in Kuopio's girls' school when her father's success as a businessman lifted the family status enough for Minna to be accepted to the school meant for the upper-class girls. However, the education given to girls wasn't equal to the ones given to boys. It was believed that the women were not capable of absorbing knowledge equal to boys, so over half of the teaching was on different handicrafts. After this school, the parents would have gladly seen Minna get married, but she was determined to study further. She got her chance when in Jyväskylä teacher seminar started accepting female students and was one of the first women to study there. However, Minna's studies were interrupted when she accepted the proposal of her science teacher Ferdinand Kant. Minna settled in the role of a married woman in Jyväskylä. She gave birth to seven children, which were probably keeping her really busy for a while, although two servants must have made the housekeeping a bit easier. I personally love this picture of Minna. She wears hand-embroidered blouse called Garibaldi, which was fashionable in the 1860s. The blouse was named after the Italian nationalist Giuseppe Garibaldi and his wife, who wore red blouses with voluminous sleeves. Minna's blouse has this cute homemade look with its cute embroidery that she might have done herself. Minna is famous for saying that not all women need to do handicrafts. Perhaps she meant that women should use whatever talents they had, whether it was inside or outside the home, but I imagine Minna frustrating herself with the needle and wishing that women shouldn't be judged for their ability to do crafts or the lack thereof. But this blouse caught my eye because of the embroidery and so I decided to replicate it. I used the Garibaldi blouse pattern by Truly Victorian as a starting point. Besides the color, this was almost exactly like Minna's. I started by sewing the shoulder seams with French seams. Then I folded and sewed the bottom bands. Next, I had to figure out the embroidery. Unlike Minna, I could use a computer to make my embroidery more even. I just couldn't replicate the skewed embroidery. I love it, but I don't think it was made purposefully asymmetric. The fabric was thin enough for me to easily trace the pattern with a magic marker. For the embroidery thread, I chose the DMC Cotton Pearl size 5. This is highly mercerized cotton and it brings out the embroidery nicely. I can't say for sure as the photo is blurry, but I believe that the stitch on Minna's blouse was a chain stitch. The chain stitch looks like a crochet chain. You make a small stitch by sticking the needle in right where it comes out. Then you wrap the thread around your needle and pull the needle out. Very easy.
The neckline is finished with a bias strip of fabric. It is important to narrow and notch the seam allowances here. The band is folded to the inside and sewn in place. Next, I drew the pattern for the neckline embroidery. I covered the edges of the buttoning band with the chain stitch embroidery and continued the pattern to the neckline edge. Then I drew and stitched the final panels at the front of the blouse. Both Minna and Ferdinand were passionate participants in the Phenomania movement, the goal of which was to raise the status of the Finnish language, which at this stage was a language of the peasant class. In 1875, Ferdinand started to edit a newspaper called Keski Suomi. Minna started writing news, articles and stories and translating foreign texts to the paper. In her writings, she particularly emphasized female education, equality and the excessive use of hard liquors. Writing to a newspaper was just a start for Minna and she started writing her first play. However, before the play was finished, Ferdinand suddenly died and Minna was left widowed with seven children. Minna's youngest child was only six weeks old when Minna sold her house in Jyväskylä and moved back to Kuopio. Next, I assembled the sleeves. The cuffs and the sleeve heads are gathered. Here I'm attaching the sleeves to the body. Now it is time to add the buttons. These metal buttons look almost identical to the ones on Mina's blouse. I hem the blouse with a simple narrow hem. The slits at the sleeves also need hemming. And then I can make the cuffs. I couldn't really see the pattern on the cuffs of the original blouse, so after some thought, I decided to take another route. I found a picture of Mina's signature and decided to embroider her name under the cuffs. Mina's father had died previously and the shop was in need of a skillful manager. So Mina started her career as a businesswoman. The new home in Kuopio consisted of two houses, one of which was the home for Mina and her small children, and the other house the shop, Mina's mother and her three oldest daughters and two shop assistants. She started putting adverts in the local paper. This photo is actually taken inside Mina's shop a few years after her death. According to the adverts, she sold at least fine wool, cashmere and merino fabrics, flannel, lace, women's hats, muffs, colors, gloves, skates, tapecloths, cloths, napkins, doilies, scarves, wine, cereals, flour, sugar, toils, dolls, sweaters, corsets, perfume, shoe black, jewelry, candles and lamp oil. I admit I had some difficulties in reading this old-fashioned print though, but still, the way the fabrics look, I definitely would want to time travel and visit her shop. The shopkeeping had also an effect on Minna's literary career that she continued. In the shop, Minna talked with people from all walks of life. 
She paid attention to the colorful Savonian dialect that the local country people spoke and the mannerisms of different social classes. She started inviting interesting people to her home, which led to the creation of Minna's Literary Salon. Besides plays and short stories, Minna continued writing opinionated essays. Freedom for the woman, freedom for action, freedom for thought. The editors do not want to deny space to the following thoughts, which, however, they find unacceptable in a few places. She also translated foreign articles on current matters and even edited a magazine of her own for a while that allowed her to bring out new thoughts, like Darwin's theory of evolution. But even her plays and stories brought out social grievances. Her story Koha Kansa, Poor People, told a sad tale of a poor railroad worker starving family, where in the end the death of a child crushes the wife mentally. Her style is described as realism, but many people disliked the way she brought out the ugly side of the society that seemingly tarnished the pure picture of the young Finnish nation others were trying to build. However, she did not back down or apologize, and these writings did have an impact, leading to many improvements being made both locally and nationally. Her sharp pen caused conflicts with her friends, but still her talents were unquestionable and recognized nationwide. Back to the sewing. Next I need to make the skirt. Minna's skirt seemed to be a pleated 1860s style skirt, so I started with the 1865 elliptical skirt pattern from Truly Victorian. I ordered this absolutely perfect green cotton satin fabric from Estonia for the skirt. Then I had to figure out how to cut the skirt to allow enough fabric for the pleats. Most of the pattern pieces already had pleats or gathering that were enough for me, but the center front panel needed widening out. So, instead of cutting the front panel to shape, I cut a large rectangle. Then I pleated the front panel on my dress form to figure out the front panel dimensions. Sewing the straight seams is fast with a modern machine. We actually know that Minna owned a sewing machine. Already in 1873 the local bookshop advertised sewing machines and there are several mentions of this new revolutionary machine in 1874 and 1875. The first machines came from Germany and they were basically Singer copies or completely silent and improved models if we believe the advertisements. My Singer 12 is from 1888 but it is still the model that first came to dominate the market and which was copied and sold around the world. Compared to modern machines, these first machines with boat-shaped shuttles were slow and they only made straight stitch. Still, compared to hand sewing, they were a huge improvement. The back of the skirt has heavy gathering that has to be done by hand. Mm -hmm. 
I sewed the heavily gathered part to the waistband also by hand, but did the rest of the waistband by machine. The last step was hemming the skirt. The demand for new plays in Finnish language was high and Minna's plays gathered audience all over the country. Both Minna's plays and short stories also sold in book format. Her being a woman didn't stop her from appearing on this article talking about the two most talented Finnish writers of the time. Her masterpiece, Anna-Lisa, was the last play she wrote and it was published in 1895. It tells the story of a young woman, Anna-Lisa, who is getting married to a man called Johannes when her old flame Mikko comes back and starts blackmailing her. Mikko and his mother know that at 15 Anna-Lisa had secretly carried Mikko's baby and killed the baby in desperation. Anna-Lisa is forced to decide between marrying Mikko or confessing her old sin. Minna's plays are still popular and have been adapted into several movies. In fact, four movies were made already during the silent film era before the 1930s. Okay, now the whole costume is ready and I'm ready to put it on. To start with, a woman in the 1860s would have worn a chemise and a corset. And let's start with the shoes. Okay, the next thing is the crinoline. In, during the 1860s we have this elliptical crinoline that I made before that has a little bit more volume at the back. Let's put it on. Rather unbuttoning all the buttons, but you can do it if you want. So this is called Garibaldi blouse, and it's the first style of the blouse that we went started wearing. And this was way before the shirt-waist era of the 1890s and the Edvardian era. Okay, now we have our shirt on. And then finally, the skirt. So my head is covered. These were really popular. The hairstyles in the 1860s were quite simple. So I have, a, have my hair in a simple bun and then I've covered everything with a crocheted hairnet that I made by myself. I'll link the pattern down below. And then I could carry a simple purse. And when I want to go outside, you could wear a pair of gloves.
Minna Kant died in 1897 in the age of 53. I don't think there was a newspaper in Finland which didn't publish an obituary and a short biography as the whole nation mourned the writer. Nowadays Minna has numerous statues erected to a memory, one in every town she lived in. Her house in Kuopio has been turned into a museum and her plays and stories are read and acted out regularly. Minna is also a role model for feminists and reformers and her words are regularly cited. So, I thank you for watching, I hope you subscribe to my channel and let's end this video with Minna's words. I have come to the conclusion that all drinking, including water, is harmful. Coffee makes the only exception.